I'm Dr. Garth Davis. I run one of the busiest uh, surgical weight loss practices in the country in Houston, Texas. It's called the Davis Clinic. And I also uh, am the head of bariatric surgery at one of the biggest hospitals in Houston. I'd like to talk with my colleagues one-on-one. -on -one. I talk to them in group settings and I give speeches and they're listening and it's changing. People are listening. But here's the problem. The surgery works too well. The surgery works too well. It it really does decrease diabetes. It really does decrease obesity. And it makes these surgeons feel like they are making huge changes in someone's life. And so it's hard for me to get their attention because they think they're doing the right thing already. And when, it's this interesting thing in obesity. When an obese patient fails, it's their fault, you know? So when their surgery doesn't work, they don't feel the blame. In other words, the patient comes back to them, they're starting to gain weight again. And the surgeon's like, you know, you're not doing it right. You're not doing something right. It's, it's all you. And so they never really come to terms with the fact that they're never to, talking with the patient about the real problem. So if I could sit down in front of the American Society of Bariatric Surgeons and I could have a talk with them, I would talk to them about the fact that the surgery works too well. We can't do this surgery on every single obese patient in the country as much as they might want to. That can't possibly be what we were born for. These bodies were not born to get operated on. This isn't happening in other parts of the world. And so I think that we should be advocates for preventing people to ever get to us. We should do less bariatric surgeries. It's still gonna be needed. There's gonna be patients that need it. But I think we should do everything in our power to prevent people from needing us. And then when they need us, we should do everything in our power to make sure that they are successful once they get their surgery. There should only be one surgery. I mean, these ideas of revision surgeries and other surgeries, and a patient fails and then we need to add this medication, that medication. The patient isn't failing, we're failing the patient by not giving them the right tools to work with. And so, I guess my big message is we need to, as surgeons, if we're gonna do the surgery, we need to provide the patients with an owner's manual on how to use the surgery. And that owner's manual needs to be all about fruits and vegetables and beans and nuts and seeds and starches and the kind of things that would have prevented the patient on getting on the table in the first place. But the mindset right now is still dominated. I, I'll tell you that a bariatric surgeon has a layperson's understanding of nutrition. And that sounds horrible, and some of my colleagues would maybe get mad at me at that, but they know it's true. They don't. They haven't read. I mean, I gave a, a talk to the Texas Society of Bariatric Surgeons. They had never heard of the EPIC study. They had never heard of the Adventist Health Study. They didn't know any of the results of the nurses health or the health professionals. These are huge, gigantic studies that focus on the profession we're dealing with. They focus on what are obese people eating or what do people eat in order to get obese. And here these obesity specialists or experts never even heard of those studies before. So, you know, my message to them would be to open your mind, to listen and to think about how did this patient get to your office in the first place and what could you do to make sure that they never have to come back. The more I educated myself, the more shocked I was. More shocked I was that people don't know about this, that other doctors don't know about this, that medical schools aren't teaching this, and the simple fact that a plant-based diet could just change your life and every disease that I treat, and maybe even worse yet, that the number one advice doctors are actually giving their patients is eat more protein. That's the number one advice given, and that may be the most dangerous, and that's been the most shocking thing I've found through all this. The problem I find with people is that we're so wedded now to breaking down food to its component parts. I mean, we no longer talk about food at all. It's all about protein and carbs and fats, and, and we just don't think of food as food. And this is really confusing to people because people are out there, my patients are coming, they're counting everything. How many calories did I get? What grams of protein? Well, that doesn't have a lot of calories, but it's got a lot of carbs, so I'm not gonna eat it. Um, or I'm gonna eat this even though it has a lot of calories because it's got a lot of protein, as if, in any way anybody's protein deficient. We're eating more protein than we could possibly ever need, and yet everybody thinks we need more protein. And this breaking down food into its macronutrients is, is breaking down people's ability to make good food judgments, which is why I see one of the worst things you could tell a patient is to eat more protein because their whole mind then becomes focused on protein. And I have the job of trying to break them of this, of this thought. And so I'll tell a patient, I want you eating fruits, I want you eating vegetables, and I get their diet log, and their diet log has none of that stuff in there. And I'm like, well, where are the fruits and vegetables? Well, I was gonna eat it, but I, you know, I was full on my sausage, and I needed my sausage in order to get my protein, so I didn't have room for the, the apple. 
And that's the problem. I mean, what we should be eating is fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, seeds, rice, potatoes. If it comes from the ground, that's what should be eaten. If it comes from a tree, that's what should be eaten. And you shouldn't have to worry about it. You shouldn't have to count it. You shouldn't have to think about it. A lot of my patients, when they really get into it and they figure it out, they love it. Because for the first time in their life, they don't have to think what to eat. They don't have to count. They don't have to measure. They could eat whatever they want of these certain foods. And it's variable. Their their meals are I like. There's a, I think there's, people say to me, "You must have a lot of willpower to stick with this diet." I'm like, "This takes no willpower at all. It's easy. I love the food." Or people think I, it's like they think um, I don't enjoy eating anymore. That I'm doing it as this. Oh my God, I'm doing this just so I could live five years longer. And that's not it. My body has become so attuned to how great it feels with the food that the food tastes better to me. It's what I want. Um, and the same thing can happen to everybody else if they could just get the Western world out of their mind. Because if you do what you always done, you get what you always got. So if you keep doing what America is always doing, you'll get what America always gets, which is not good. Put away the calculators and the scales and eat what nature gives us. I have a new book out. It's called Proteinaholic, um, Our Obsession with Meat and Why It's Killing Us. And I wrote this book because probably the biggest problem I got getting people to change their diet was this obsession with protein. And even in plant-based eaters, there's an obsession with protein. And so they're getting protein shakes and soy shakes and this shake and rice protein, and everybody's worried about protein. And yet, all the studies I see is the more protein you eat, the sicker you are, and that we are way overeating. And, and, and in my career, I've never seen someone protein deficient. It's just not anything I see. I've seen a lot of fiber deficiency and phytonutrient deficiencies, but I just never see a protein deficiency. And so I wanted to write a book that would, first of all, tell my story about how I got to this and take people on a look around the world at the diets around the world. Because there's always, you always hear this, well, look, the, the uh, Inuits in Alaska eat a lot of fat and they're healthy. No, they're not. Or, um, you know, um, different cultures in Africa where they eat mainly meat are healthy. No, they're not. I really wanted to take all the science because there's so much in the, in the literature that gets misconstrued and misused on the internet by people that don't know what they're talking about, that there's become a lot of confusion out there. People don't know what to believe. Well, he says this and he says this, so I'm just not going to believe anybody. So I wanted in this book to teach people how to read science, how to show where there's bias in science, and to show the huge amount of science showing that plant-based diet is the right way to go and that protein doesn't matter at all. And so this, is, uh, this book really took me years and years of study, years and years of work to try to capture the message I tell patients in an everyday meeting when I sit down with patients that helps them turn their life around. And I hope the book could do that for a lot of people.